name is Michael Stevens, and I'm an assistant librarian here at Scott County Public Library in Georgetown, Kentucky. Well, the Halloween season is with us again, and the ghosts and goblins have come out to play. But we have a real treat for you today. Kathleen Hake is here, and she's going to share with us the history of hearses and how they've been some very unusual ones throughout the years and throughout history. So without further ado, Hearses Throughout History with Kathleen Hake. Thank you, Michael. We'll certainly be talking about going out in style and how hearses have evolved through history. And I know that you did uh, previously this summer a session on cemetery rubbings. Yes. And cemeteries as we know them today and as the cemetery rubbing that you did really didn't exist until the 1820s. So that of course brings up the question of what did we do before then? And how did we get the bodies from wherever they died to those cemeteries? Well, originally we started out with very simple wagons like this funeral cortege of Richard II in 1468. This is a very interesting vehicle. We can see the, the big wheels on it. There's no way to, for them to really turn uh, those front wheels. So we know that they're not gonna be taking a, a really tight turn. And we can see that they flip up on the sides and that allows circulation for the, for the body and also allows us to see that this is our um, loved one or uh, in this case, our king and that this is indeed his body and that nobody has been uh, supplemented for him. So we know that this is, is truly him and we can glaze upon them in reflection as they pass. Um, there's several other things that horse people might recognize in this and one is that there are four horses in line pulling this vehicle and that they're being ridden. There is no driver per se. And this is pretty common for quite a few years and until really we get into the Victorian era and Queen Victoria teaches us a whole new way to mourn when Prince Albert dies, this is, this is not unusual. But the question remains as when a ruler dies unexpectedly, how can you build some of these ornate hearses that we used to see? And this image that we're looking at right now is the funeral procession of Bishop John Isop in 1532. And while it doesn't really give us the exact idea of what happened with Henry VIII's hearses, it gives us an idea. And because you cannot cure wood fast enough to make these ornate um, hearses, it turns out that they actually, in, in many cases, were used wax. And tons of wax. In this case, uh, there were three royal hearses made in the 14th century. And the first one had 1.1 tons of wax. The one in Windsor had 1.8 tons of wax. And that was on top of the actual body that was encased in lead. And so they used multiple horses, somewhere between six and eight, um, ridden by very young children to pull this. And it would have been an immense thing. And it was very, very tall and elaborate, but wax gave them an, uh, a medium to work in that could be used very quickly and, and in relative um, speed and, and ornateness. But that also explains why they don't still exist it, because wax melts. And in many cases, they were just melted down or um, decayed over the years and were not kept. But can you imagine a, a 14 foot tall wax hearse coming towards you it must have been an amazing sight pulled by six to eight horses that it just would have been just mind-blowing in today's today's world on the other hand we have these very simple funeral briars that they also used and this one you can see is extremely simple um, and this one was used in the UK as well it just ha it has the expanding um, platform so that you can make sure that the coffin does not move on it. The slides are slightly curved. And one thing you'll also know is that here, the wheels can turn more. And so, although there's a pole running down the middle of the hearse, or the briar, um, the wheels can turn until they hit that pole. And that means that they can travel further and actually 
go down a road and curve and pull into a cemetery and things like that, which becomes important when we start actually making cemeteries and we want to go around them. They're not, or they're made in a square, because up until then we couldn't really make those tight turns with the funeral vehicle. And so this is something that, you know, we go from the very ornate to the very simple. And it goes back and forth like this throughout history. We have this, this trend that goes. And we see that even when we come over to the United States, this particular 18th century horse-drawn hearse wagon was believed to be one of the first or, or oldest hearses that we know about. And this one was bought used in the town uh, in 1820. Again, we can see it's very simple. It has very tall sides on it. And in this case, we probably weren't being able to see our loved one. Whereas on the other one, we could see the casket as it went by. So we don't know if this would have been um, used by a church or uh, by the town. I believe that this one was bought by the town. And that actually brings up a great question of how much did people pay to be buried in a hearse? You didn't typically buy the use of a hearse. You paid money into the town or you paid money into the church that owned the vehicle. And therefore, that when you um, passed away as a member of that church or that town, then you were allowed the services of the hearse. In some cases, you could rent the hearse. Um, and they often were relatively expensive. Um, about a dollar for that time period, which at that time was, was expensive. Um, as we move on with this particular view, we see that in times of war, like the Civil War, U.S. Civil War, we also see very simple vehicles. This one at the Fraser Museum in Louisville, Kentucky, is one that would have been used during the times of war. And in those cases, you have so many um, funerals going on at a, at a time that you do need to have something very simple but yet elegant, which is what this vehicle is. Again, you can see that we can make turns. The wheels have a, have a uh, quite a turning radius, but those back wheels are so large to be able to hold the weight. You can see that this platform is perfectly flat. Um, so at this point in time, there's nothing to help um, the attendants move the casket on and off the um, hearse. But it's a very simple but elegant solution for in times of war. As we move on through history, we see more ornate vehicles. And this is what we tend to think of when we think of horse-drawn hearses. So this hearse was made by the Tolman Russell and Company at Exchange Street in Worcester, Massachusetts. It has a maker's tag on it, and that's how we know. You'll see that it has the great big round glass on it with the drapes, draperies in it. And this particular type of vehicle, the glass would actually slide out, perhaps. Um, and that's how you would go in to be able to clean it and to do things like that. After a while, we begin to make smaller windows, which brings up the question of, well, how do I get in to clean it because you have sanitary issues. You also have all the flowers that were donated by the relatives and different trinkets that would have gone in there. And you would need to get those out. It's a, caskets are, are a fairly long thing and hearses are even longer. So it wouldn't be very practical to reach in. In this case, you would have moved the glass out of the window and been able to reach in. Once those windows get smaller, there becomes trap doors underneath. And so you could literally go in through this little trap door underneath the, the hearse and squeeze in and clean in there and then put the trap, go back out and put the trap door up. If you go to the Kentucky Horse Park and the International Museum of the Horse, uh, they have a um, hearse there that's often on display that has a trap door and you can see it if you reach, look down underneath it. It's quite the, quite the interesting thing. But one of the things that happens around this time is that we start being able to use briar pins and rollers and things like that to help move the casket into the vehicle. This happens, this technology happens at the later part of the 1800s. Um, once we get into the 
1800s, uh, 1858 through 1901, we really see a lot of changes in technology that involves hearses. And of course, Prince Albert died in 1960, or excuse me, 1861. And that's when really a lot of attention became onto the concept of mourning while Queen Victoria led the, essentially the world in mourning for him. Um, we went from very uh, classic lined, simple hearses to more ornate, and we started seeing this flourishment of technology and um, craftsmanship within the hearses, which you see a little bit within this one. And we can see in this one the briar pin, which is this metal object here that helps hold the hearse or the casket in place. When we look at these, there are actually multiple rollers that help the hearse move, excuse me, the casket move. The actual roller that's in the back that helps people put it up is about a foot wide and they can be made of multiple different types of material. In some cases, they're made of metal and those are the newer ones. They were often made of wood and occasionally you see them made of cork. Basically, you wanted to be able to put that um, casket up and be able to roll it easier. The um, briar pin, which held the casket in, those are kind of rare today. They tend to be one of the things that gets lost when we talk about purses that are collectibles. Because although they were about seven and a half inches tall, they were made of metal that was somewhat valuable, so you could melt them down to make other things. And they're just very easy to lose. But each uh, hearse would have had six with it at a time. Two on each side, and one at the hood, head and the footer. And that would have allowed the hearse to be able to transport any size person that they needed to. Now, let's talk about these ornate hearses that came out of the mid-1800s. And this one in particular was made by James Cunningham and Son, and he, they were in Rochester, New York. They made some amazing hearses, and they shipped them all over the world. This particular one went to um, South America, but they also have an example where one made a 3,000 tra mile train ride from Rochester, New York, out west, and they happened to have a little visitor while that was going on, because when that hearse got to the other end, they found out that there had been a hobo in that uh, hearse the whole way, and uh, he had left behind some chewing tobacco, and uh, taken with him the brass lamps and everything else that was valuable that he could take with him. So there were some interesting little tidbit <laughs> stories like that. Um, but these, this particular hearse is a gothic type hearse, and it is 14 feet long, eight feet tall, and it took carvers, there are 14 different carvers, three months to build. It is an amazing piece of art. And um, the Cunningham and Sons name was very well known for these hearses. When they came to the um, Chicago World's Fair, they had several that were exhibited there. They have one that was exhibited that has a curved glass um, casing on the sides which is amazing at the time, technology, to do that. And so, you know, these things took a lot of time and had a lot of art put into them and a lot of thought. Now, that always brings us to the question of, what is the biggest hearse? And this particular one is in, overseas. Um, it is a tremendous amount, a tremendous size. The angels that are on the side are three feet tall which kind of gives you an idea of just how big it is. So they're the size of a small child. Um, this takes eight horses to make, or excuse me, eight horses to haul, and was made in 1895. It weighs three tons, so that's 6,000 pounds, um, just in and of itself. It is four yards tall. So it is an amazing vehicle. And when I was uh, prepping for this talk, I happen to connect with the uh, grandchild of um, the original maker, and they are still so proud of this vehicle, and it's great to see that type of family uh, pride continue on. Now we talk about these huge vehicles, but there were also very, very small ones made. This particular one, I've been told, is a children's hearse, 
It's unusual in that it's a children's horse that is painted black, but it is quite small. You can see how, how tiny it is in relation to the gentleman standing next to it. And because people died not only in the summer, but also in the winter, it does have sleigh runners on it. Now this particular vehicle I don't believe was meant to go both with or without wheel, with, with wheels and runners, but a lot of them were able to be converted. And that was not uncommon because there's a limit to how much one person can own. And you can see in this one, we have smaller glass planes. It, it does not have a trap door on it because it is small and you could have reached in to, to take care of it. It does have a couple of fennels on the top, but it's, an, it's a very nice piece, but it's not necessarily a piece of art. But museums are now collecting hearses as works of art which is particularly this vehicle from the Canadian Museum of History. And this carriage maker in Quebec built this magnificent three horse hearse in 1898 for his funeral car. This is a work of art. The craftsmanship that went into this and the elegance that is involved in this particular vehicle is amazing. And you can see from the pictures on the side, during the summer when it's on wheels, it had three horses that worked with it. In the winter, which I'm sure was quite frequent in Quebec, I'm sure that they had a lot of snow and ice, they had four horses with it just to make it a little easier to pull. And they, the same purse, they just took the wheels off and put the sleigh runners on. And just to show you a little bit of the amazing artwork, craftsmanship, this is um, a piece of it. And you can get into a whole another lecture on the symbolism that is on um, coaches and purse and, and different vehicles. The craftsmanship period, although there were vehicles that were made for specific people and for specific funeral homes that were works of art, but the craftsmanship era really lasted about 10 years where you have these incredible, incredible vehicles that were built. And then after that, it kind of peters out and they learn how to make them um, essentially in factory and using new technology and new um, craft tools, they could make them faster than you could by hand. And then you started being able to just buy them from catalog and essentially plug them into your hearse. Um, so at this point, you know, this type of a vehicle, this is craftsmanship. And you just don't see that very often anymore. And it's fantastic to see museums begin to appreciate them as the works that they are. Now the other question that comes up is, well, most of these that we've looked at before are tied somehow into Catholicism and, and particularly Catholic religions. And so what happens when you go outside of that? And this is a Jewish hearse, because no matter what religion you're in, you still have to get the body to the cemetery. And you can see it's a little plainer. Um, this one probably was built for a little bit more arid um, location. You can see that the wheels can have a fair amount of turn to them. There is a um, pole going down the middle, so you can't make a full fifth wheel turn, but you can do pretty good. Um, it's probably pulled by at least two horses, possibly more. And it's uh, very contained and it's graceful art. And it's very elegant. It's not quite as ornate though. And you do see less of these, unfortunately, just because um, people do like to collect the ornate. Which brings us to this beautiful white purse. So almost all the purses that we've looked at prior to this are black. And that's because men tend to, we have a lot of population of men, and black is what we traditionally bury men in. Traditionally, when it's available, we like to bury women in white, or women and children in white vehicles. Now that's not always possible. And ladies, anybody that has, if you've ever blended shades of makeup and done color correction, you will understand how hard it is before we get into commercial white paint to create white paint. So varnish puts a yellow tinge to everything. And these carriages would have up to 18 coats of paint. So you would start out with white lead um, paint and you would have to add a blue tint to it to be able to cancel out the yellow tint from the varnish. You would put it on 
and then you would go back through and fill in any cracks with a white paste and then you would have to put another layer on and again color correcting all the way through so you're mixing in a little bit of blue a little bit of green all to correct that yellow varnish sometimes you come out with a gray vehicle by accident um, and in a traditional form a gray vehicle would be used for married women or unmarried um, bachelor gentlemen so we really have, when you get into formal tradition with hearses, some color codes. The color codes don't necessarily hold true today. Um, we have very recently had some very uh, televised um, funerals, and in one they did have a white hearse, and that was a gentleman. And so obviously that means something different to the people that chose that vehicle. And in some cases it means um, just purity and um, purity of spirit, that type of thing. And particularly in um, different cultures, they see white as a celebration of purity and, and that type of thing. And so it's, it's not unusual for any um, person to be buried in white. These horses also happen to have this lovely um, netting on them. And there's two reasons to have this netting. One is that it just adds to the, the remembrance, the spectacle of, of this funeral so that it would stick in your mind and you would remember this person longer. But it also serves a very practical purpose of, of keeping the flies off the horses. These horses would need to stand for quite a while while the funeral is going on and walk nicely up to the uh, cemetery, etc. and uh, you know, a badly timed horse fly bite could result in a wreck, which results in some stories that we're not going to share today because they're a little bit horrifying. <laughs> but uh, needless to say, fly nets were, were something that if you were able to offer them and your client was able to afford them, were very popular. But again, you did have to pay for that extra little bit, so not everybody uses them. We talked about the black funeral hearses carriages and we're going to go back a little bit because this happens to hit around 1916. And what we looked at a moment ago was 19, early 1900s. This 1916 is very ornate. And we've gone through this period where we see the glass and being able to see the body. At this point, right now, we've um, for this particular family, they chose a purse that kind of looks like a nutshell and that you can't see the body at all. Um, it's very interesting when you get into knowing about Emperor Franz Joseph and his wife Sissy who was Empress Elizabeth and their son Crown Prince Rudolf. They appreciated the um, circumstances around royalty and they knew that you need to put on a show but they themselves were not very um, ornate people and so they wanted something that was appropriate for their funeral without being too over the top. And this was the vehicle that they chose. Um, and it is still is in existence and it has been used, or excuse me, it's in the uh, museum there. But, uh, and this again is a work of art. This is suspended. Everything else that we've looked at is on a flat wooden board. This particular one is suspended on leather traces. And so we're going to go and look at this. We're going to move forward a little bit in history. We're going to take a look at the Cribs and Sun vehicles. These are from England. And this actually happens to be a pair of horses that we often see at the Royal Windsor Horse Show in the trade turnout. Um, so there's two things about this particular vehicle. One, you'll notice it's not a hearse. That's because there are multiple vehicles that are needed in association with a hearse. You still need to take the um, flowers. You need to take people with you. Um, there's embalmer wagons and different things. So this happens to be one that is for her carriage masters and funeral furnishers. These horses are is very common for them to be showing in the morning and then go and work a funeral in the afternoon. Uh, they're, they're very famous for that or vice versa. 
but they are working horses that happen to show as well. And they're very, very popular in the trade turnout classes. And they just bring a, a just a nice um, brush of fresh air. These um, are Frisian horses, which often people ask about. And they were um, very commonly used for funerals because they do tend to be black. They're all, almost always black. And they tend to have a, a nice disposition so they um, don't want to run off and, and do silly things while you're in the middle of a funeral. This vehicle here happens to be a T-Cribs and Sun vehicle as well. It's a Schilbearer carriage. And this is a very interesting vehicle. You can see that the hearse goes in the front underneath the driver's seat. And then your um, loved ones can travel right with the body and um, be right there. Now, George Schilberer, who built this vehicle, was quite, has quite a story. He got actually um, let out of a Debitor prison to be able to build some of these vehicles. And one of the questions that often comes up is, how do you get the casket in here? There are a couple of different ways to make these. One is so that there are pins on the bottom and the actual um, area where the casket goes actually pivots. And so therefore you can pull the pins, put the casket in, put it, put it back in, uh, the, and put the pins in, and then go to the cemetery. In other cases, you can kind of see there, there is room underneath the driver's seat, um, and sometimes, not often, but sometimes you can slide a casket in through there. Um, in some cases, not so much with this particular type of hearse, but um, if there was a mother and child, sometimes the mother's body would be in the um, casket area, and then the small um, casket for the child would be right behind the driver's seat, and then they could take them both to the cemetery together. Which also brings up the question of what happens when there are multiple funerals at one time. This is crowd and horse-drawn hearses from at a mass burial in a cemetery in North Collingwood, Ohio in 1907. I believe this was a gas explosion. There are only so many funeral parlors in, so, in an area, particularly during this time period. So communities would come together to bury their dead. It is not unusual for that to happen. Unfortunately, things like a catastrophe of a gas explosion were, well, not uncommon in the area era. And so it was expected that if a tragedy happened in your area, the others would kick in and help. They would bring their horse and wagons. Uh, they would have um, funeral masses. Uh, other reverends would come, that type of thing. Whereas if, if that happened to another community, you were expected to go over and help them as well. And, that, and when those things happened, I don't believe that that $1 that we talked about earlier that you had to pay to have those um, use the hearse, I don't believe that those things were in effect. I think the community just came together. Not seen any records where they, they charged the families at those times, um, whereas with an individual family, you would have. So one of the most common questions that I get asked is, well, how much is a hearse worth today? So this is a hearse that sold in October of 19, 2019, and it went for $4,500 at the Martin's Carriage Auction, which is in Pennsylvania. And you can see this one is set up for a pair of horses. It does have quite a bit of turnability with the wheels. It actually can go pretty much completely underneath the body. And it is set up for either, a, um, either an unmarried man or a um, woman to be, married woman to be buried in. You could also use this one for a child. It's more of a gray than a white, but you could, if you were gonna redo it, you could do it either way. Um, but that's, mm, there are occasions when they go higher than that, and special vehicles that have Providence often do, but um, it's not unusual for them to sell. They're, they're commonly found at um, carriage auctions around the country. The other question that comes up quite a bit is one that might surprise you and that is about the plumes that go on the top of the horses. So if you were poor, 
just like that netting that we talked about earlier, you may not have any plumes with your funeral. If you were of modest means, you might have three or four. If you're really wealthy, you might have four, five or six. And if you were rich, you got seven. And this all ties into the Victorian era and um, there was a fascination during this time with Egyptians and the feather of truth. And you can look that up if you're interested in it, but it really gets interesting on how uh, Egyptian uh, religious practices kind of make their way into Victoria and England and uh, make their way out in, in feathers on a horse's head during a funeral. It's not something that you would normally think about happening. And that kind of concludes how the, this history of hearses. But I did want to talk just a little bit more about hearses that we currently see. So we talked about earlier that in a lot of the hearses that we're seeing televised right now, that the hearses can be any color that they want to be. And that is a reflection of what is available in their area and what the family chooses. I have a friend that runs a funeral um, service, and they've even had them done as a memorial service with like a Cinderella type coach for a child. And so it really depends on what you're doing, particularly with a memorial service. The other thing that we've seen recently is the modest vehicle, often pulled by a farm animal, either a um, draft horse or a mule, and the plain black wagon. And particularly when we're talking politicians, that brings up the idea of humble origins and is something that they want to reflect. We don't see that a lot, but we do um, see it. We saw it in Martin Luther King's um, funeral service and we saw it in recently. So if you're looking at funeral things, there are some definite references out there that you may want to check out at your local library. You can um, look at pictures from the Royal Windsor Horse Show if you're interested in um, more current vehicles, or there is a um, book put out by the um, Carriage Museum of America called Horse-Drawn um, Funeral Vehicles, and that is an excellent reference if you're looking for detailed information on hearses. So thank you very much. And happy Halloween, everybody.